Workmen engaged in excavating for the foundation for new bottle works on Vernon Avenue unearthed two human skulls and a number of bones. The spot used to be a private burial plot, and last summer, the bodies were removed. From the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, October 5, 1900. Welcome to Buried Secrets, a podcast about the paranormal, the occult, and weird and forgotten history. I'm Chris. I hope everyone's doing well. Not everyone had a good week. I'm excited about this week's topic, which is a look at a couple local cemeteries that are hidden and not very well known. You know, Queens is famous for our cemetery belt, the group of huge cemeteries that you can see from space, kind of on the Queens and Brooklyn border. But it's not very well known that we have a few little tiny cemeteries that are scattered around the neighborhood, hidden behind churches and through alleyways and stuff. So really excited to talk about a couple of those. And as always, as soon as I started researching, I found way more information than I thought I would. So I'm just going to talk about a couple this week and look at some more next week. So before we get to talking about cemeteries, I just wanted to talk about what I've been reading this week. This week, I think I read three books, though The three books I finished had nothing to do with the podcast or the paranormal or the occult, so I'm not going to talk about those. But I have been reading a book that I alluded to last week that I'm really enjoying that is related to the occult. So I'm reading a book called La Santa Muerte, Unearthing the Magic and Mysticism of Death by Toma Prower. It's a really cool book. It came out last summer, and I don't know how I missed it. I just stumbled across it a couple of weeks ago. And it claims to be the first book written by a practitioner about Santa Muerte. I don't know if it's the first book in English or actually the first book. It seems wild that there wouldn't have already been a book in Spanish about it, but who knows? I'm just partway through. I've gotten through the bit about the history of Santa Muerte. And now I'm at the part where it's kind of talking about the details of his practice and kind of how Santa Muerte is venerated and what sorts of magical practices people use with relation to Santa Muerte. So really interesting. You know, when I did an episode about Santa Muerte last year, that was just a really quick overview. But if you're interested at all in Santa Muerte, I really recommend this book. I find Santa Muerte such an interesting figure and I'm really enjoying it. So that's what I'm reading this week. And let's get into today's topic. Today's episode will be focusing on a couple hidden cemeteries right here in Astoria, New York. So I talk a lot about Astoria, the neighborhood. It's almost like a town within Queens. So Queens has a bunch of different neighborhoods, but unlike the rest of New York City, if you write a letter to someone who lives in Queens, you can't say Queens, New York in the address. You have to say where they live. So like Astoria, New York, Woodside, New York, Jackson Heights, New York, Flushing, New York, etc. So Queens does have kind of like a little bit more of a vibe of there being little towns within the larger borough, and Astoria is one of them. So like I've mentioned before, Astoria is in northwestern Queens. It's right on the water, and I have no idea how well known Astoria is outside of New York City. Like before I moved here when I was a teenager, I had only heard of Queens from the Ramones song We're a Happy Family. <laughs> So I'm just going to assume that people know about that much about Queens, like the fact that it exists, and then I guess anything I've mentioned on the podcast. But whether or not you're familiar with Astoria, you've almost certainly seen Astoria in TV and movies, because there's a huge film industry presence here, and there has been since the 1920s. And I've talked a lot about how I used to live right next to the big film campus in the southern part of Astoria, which is made up of Kaufman Astoria Studios, the Museum of the Moving Image, which I've talked about before. And there's also a big movie theater over there as well. And one of these days, I'll do an episode about some of the rumored hauntings in that film complex, because there are some interesting stories back in my old part of the neighborhood. But basically, Kaufman Astoria Studios has the biggest soundstage space anywhere in the U.S. east of Hollywood, so or at least east of California. So a lot of stuff ends up being filmed there, as well as on the streets of Astoria. So some films where you can see at least some shots of the streets of Astoria include 
movies like Goodfellas and A Bronx Tale. The newest set of Spider-Man movies has a couple scenes from Astoria. And also TV shows like Orange is the New Black and Seinfeld feature shots of Astoria. In Seinfeld, George's family home was in Astoria. And of course, hundreds of other films and TV shows has, have also been made in Astoria. So that's where you may have seen or heard of Astoria, aside from me talking about it incessantly. So let's look at the history of Astoria real quick. So starting with colonizers in Astoria, so Peter Stuyvesant, the last Dutch mayor of New Amsterdam, who was a very bad man who I've talked about before, he granted a man named William Hallett some land on the shore of Astoria in the mid-1600s. And according to the 1882 book, History of Queens County, the land was inhabited by the Canarsie tribe at the time that the colonizers got here. Though according to nativeland.ca, the Muncie Lenape and the Wappinger tribes and maybe the Mateencock lived in the area as well. So that book, History of Queens County, says that two members of the Canarsi tribe supposedly deeded the land to, to the colonizers in the area on July 9th, 1666, though it doesn't go into a lot of detail. And at the time, the area was called Mespat or Mespatches, which is where the name Maspeth, which is a part of Queens, comes from. And that's according to the book... The Annals of Newtown by James Riker, which was written in 1852. I will say I always take things written in old books with a grain of salt, especially when it talks about indigenous peoples of the area, since old books tend to be pretty racist and you never know what's accurate or not. However, as far as I can tell, this seems to be the history, having poked around a few other places. So the oldest buildings in Astoria that are still standing are from 200 years after that, so from the mid-19th century. And a fur merchant named Stephen Ailing Halsey incorporated the village of Astoria in 1839. There was a lot of argument about what the town should be called, but it ended up being named after the wealthiest man in America, John Jacob Astor. The idea that I've read some places is that People wanted to name it after Astor in the hopes that he would invest money in Astoria. Though some places that I read it kind of made it sound like he just had like a fan club of people who liked him. A little bit unclear. But like many rich people today, Astor never bothered coming to Astoria, even though it was named after him. Instead, he lived in a summer mansion called Astoria on East 87th Street in Manhattan. And he could look across the river from there and see Astoria. There were some wealthy businessmen, many of whom were in the lumber and shipping industries, who did move to Astoria, however. Their houses were built fairly near the water in an area that is sometimes called Astoria Village or Old Astoria nowadays. At the time, there was a ferry that went between Astoria and Manhattan, and service to that ferry was restored a few years back. Though other than the ferry, this part of Astoria isn't super accessible. It's a bit of a weird tucked away pocket. And despite having first moved to Western Queens back in 2012 and having spent a lot of time exploring Astoria on foot, I actually had no idea that old Astoria was a thing that existed until last year when I was searching for cemeteries in the area and found two cemeteries in old Astoria. So that brings us to our first cemetery, St. George's Episcopal Church Cemetery. So this is a cemetery that's located in the churchyard of the historic St. George's Episcopal Church of Astoria, which I believe is the oldest church in Astoria. In 1825, a wealthy landowner named Robert Blackwell donated the land to build the church. And for longtime listeners, yes, this is Robert Blackwell of the Blackwell family, for whom nearby Blackwell's Island, now called Roosevelt Island, was named. And I've discussed Roosevelt Island in great detail in the Renwick Smallpox Hospital episodes and also the episodes about the Victorian Lunatics Fort and the Victorian Lighthouse that once stood and now stand there. 
So if you want to know more about Roosevelt Island, check those out. But the Blackwells were a big old family who were very wealthy in Astoria in the 19th century. So the original building for the church, which burned down in 1894, was located on what is today Astoria Boulevard, which is a little bit away from the current structure, I think maybe a block or so away, which was built at 27th Avenue and 14th Street in 1904. So if you go to the church's website, it has a history section. However, that section only contains a clipping of a January 11th, 1894 New York Times article titled St. George in Ruin, Oldest Protestant Episcopal Church in Astoria Destroyed by Fire. So it describes how the fire started. I'll read a bit from it. Funeral services were to have been held in the church this morning. And in order to have the edifice comfortably heated, the sexton built a fire in the furnace last night. It is believed that the furnace became overheated and set fire to the woodwork. There's something a little bit ironic to me about a church burning down because of a funeral. Here's what the article had to say about what the old church was like. So to read from that, it was a framed structure and stood on high ground on the corner of Main and Woolsey streets. It was surrounded by a spacious churchyard containing the vaults and graves of members of the oldest families. The destroyed church contained a number of marble tablets erected to the memory of some of the oldest members of the congregation and several former rectors. There's also something really strange and dark to me about the history section of an extremely historic church's website only containing one single article from the 19th century about the first version of the church being burned down. The website also has a page about the cemetery, but it just says under construction when you click on it. So the church history is somewhat obfuscated, and I did have to do a decent amount of digging to find stuff about it. So I haven't been inside the church, but it's supposed to be really nice. It's supposed to have somewhat recently restored stained glass windows. It's really beautiful from the outside, I can say. It sounds like in recent years, the parish has had some financial troubles. So in 2005, some of the land was leased or maybe sold to a developer who tore down the parish house, which was a historic building, which had once been the Astoria Institute for the Education of Young Ladies. And they replaced it with a very ugly building, which seems to be some sort of nursing home or senior residence. The first time I went there, it was to look for the final resting place of the Blackwell family. And when I went, I was rewarded with views of a beautiful church that it just looks like it's been transported from the English countryside. It's so beautiful. However, it was very difficult to see the Blackwell plot because I discovered that if you walk around to the side of the church where the cemetery is, one, there's no gate to get into the cemetery. And two, there's a very tall retaining wall and the cemetery is on top of that. So you can barely see the cemetery. Though if you cross the street and jump up and down, you can kind of see the Blackwell family plot in the cemetery. But the Blackwells weren't always buried in the cemetery by St. George's Church. At one point, they had their own burying ground, which was in use from around 1780 to 1854. It was located near the water, a little bit southwest of where St. George's is. Interestingly, the location of the cemetery was immediately south of where the Roosevelt Island Bridge, which was built in the 1950s, stands now. And what makes that interesting to me is that the bridge that leads to the island once named for the Blackwells, is now right at the location where the Blackwells once buried their dead. I guess it makes sense, right? They had land on the island and also on the other side of the river by the island, but just interesting. According to the book The Graveyard Shift, A Family Historian's Guide to New York City Cemeteries by Carolee Inskeep, more than 60 people were buried in the old family cemetery. And around 1900, the remains were moved to St. George's Churchyard, And after that, a bottle factory was built on the site. You'll remember that from the cold open. Today, the Ravenswood Generating Station, a huge power plant that was built in the 1960s, stands at that location. Just want to pause and talk about the power plant. So about 20% of New York City's electricity comes from that plant. And as someone who spends a decent amount of time around that area, I can tell you that it is very hard to breathe near that particular station especially in the summer when the peaker is running. And if you want a very non-scientific definition of what a peaker plant is, it's basically like a backup power source that 
comes online when there's a really high need for electricity. So in New York City, that's typically in the summer when it's really hot and everyone's running their air conditionings. And the peaker plant and peakers in general burn really dirty fuel. So the pollution is much worse when they're on and it's more expensive. And since power needs have gone up and up in recent years, I've read that like the peaker just runs a lot more than you might think it should. And incidentally, as these things often happen, the power plant was built right, basically right next to the largest public housing project in North America, the Queensbridge Houses. So all 6,000 people who live there have to breathe in the terrible air all the time. There's also a beautiful park right next door, but that's not the park that I usually hang out at on the Queen's waterfront because of the terrible air quality. And you know, there's a reason why parts of Astoria are known as Asthma Alley, and that's because respiratory illnesses are more common near the power plants. So I know that was a little bit of a digression, but I feel like I can't mention the Ravenswood generating station without talking a little bit about that. So anyway, the Ravenswood plant stands in the Ravenswood part of Astoria, which is kind of a neighborhood within Astoria. And the power plant's plot was also at one point the location of the Jacob Blackwell mansion. So for a time, a bunch of wealthy people built fancy homes in Ravenswood. Though by the 1870s, the rich people moved further east on Long Island, and many of their old mansions were turned into orphanages and asylums. My understanding is that they were asylums both for people with mental health problems, but also I read that some of the asylums were for sex workers. I guess there were like asylums or homes for fallen women or sex workers back then. But if the idea of turning old abandoned rich people's mansions into asylums isn't the most Victorian and Gothic thing you can think of. I don't know what is. Incidentally, I was just reading the excellent website, The Newtown Pentacle, which is run by Mitch Waxman. And I wanted to read a little bit from what he wrote about that area in a blog post from last week, because it's very relevant. So to read from that, 1909 is the year that the Queensboro Bridge opened for business. And that was just 10 years after the Queens itself was fashioned by Manhattan's ready political hands. Then, as now, riverfront property is quite valuable. Prime industrial land was being wasted on the indigent and immoral, so these mansions became quite prone to grisly total loss fires. Can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs, as the saying goes. So this is interesting. I didn't really see this in other parts of my research, but it makes sense, right? There's all sorts of accidental fires to clear out space to build some factories. That seems right. You know, just a couple weeks ago, I was talking about the Bronx in the 70s and 80s and how a lot of landlords had their buildings set on fire. Seems like New York real estate has a tendency to accidentally on purpose burn down if it serves the interests of wealthy people. So to get back to the Blackwells, even though the remains of the Blackwells were moved from the area on the water by the old Blackwell Mansion to St. George's Church, I found a delightful article in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle from October 5th, 1900 that I read from for the cold open, and it has my favorite kind of headline, Human Skulls Unearthed. The article also mentioned how the property where the bottle factory was, at the time at least, known as the Old Williams Estate, where the Blackwells were buried there. So I don't know if the Williams were like neighbors or had an estate right next to the Blackwell Mansion or what exactly. Maybe the Williams moved in after the Blackwells left. I don't know. But the article said that the construction folks would put any other remains that they found of the Blackwell family in the Blackwell family vault at St. George's Church. And also, this is just too fun not to share, for me at least. I love looking at old historical newspapers because there's always such weird stuff that you stumble upon. So, you know, I read the article about human skulls being unearthed, and then the next article down was headlined, Opossum Killed. And it was about a large possum that had been eating 
chickens in the area of Freeport, Long Island, and which was killed. For some reason, I found it really hilarious that the newspaper, you know, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, was reporting on a possum being killed. Though, I don't know, your mileage may vary on that. So let's get back to St. George's Church. So the church looks like it was constructed from my expert eye of nice stone. That's nice G N E I S S. I'm not just saying that the stone looks nice, though it also does. And the masonry is maybe rubble masonry. I'm so bad at identifying these things, and there aren't that many write ups of what the church looks like. So I'm having to use my own words here. But the masonry does look pretty like rough. And it looks very, you know, European. It looks like something you'd find in the English countryside. It has a tall tower crowned with gargoyles. And of course, there's stained glass windows and ornate doors. It's a really beautiful church. And tucked behind it is a tiny, charming churchyard cemetery. So like I mentioned, the graveyard is elevated by a high stone retaining wall and then encircled by a chain link fence. So it is difficult to get too close and see much, though the Blackwell marker for that plot is pretty big, so it's somewhat easy to see that one. Like I mentioned, you might need to jump up and down a little depending on how tall you are. But when I went back last month, I found another way to see into the cemetery. So there's a small alleyway on the other side of the church. It looks kind of like a parking lot, like a private driveway or alleyway. And if you go down there, I found that if I kind of climbed behind a big white panel truck, I was able to see through some of the collapsed fence because the wall is is much lower on that side of the cemetery and it's also starting to crumble. So I wasn't dressed for climbing up like a five foot wall, but if you were so inclined, I guess that's the way into the cemetery. And I did read somewhere, I think it was an article written by Kevin Walsh of Forgotten New York. I read somewhere saying like, oh, access to the cemetery is through a small alleyway. And previously I couldn't find the small alleyway because I didn't think it that he meant like a hidden private driveway. But that seems to be perhaps the official way into the cemetery. I don't know. But there is a broken fence there and you can see in pretty well. So if you live in the area... That's how you look into the cemetery. And also, if you're in the area, if you're visiting, I recommend going about one block west because there's a really cool church there, too. I think it's maybe the first Reformed Church of Astoria. It's a very beautiful historic church with this amazing spire. Like I said, it's a very cool and historic part of the neighborhood. And also, if you're in the area, it's really worth walking around because there's all these mansions and just beautiful old homes. When I was there last spring, there was a lot of, you know, creeping wisteria and beautiful flowers. And there were wrought iron gates and rustic stone walls. And you just really feel like you're in this other world. So the next cemetery I want to talk about is actually sort of a false one. So around the 1860s, according to a February 19th, 1899 article in the New York Sun, quote, trouble occurred in the congregation of St. George's Episcopal Church, and a number of the influential members withdrew and organized the Church of the Redeemer. The new congregation held services for some time in a store, but in a few years came to own a handsome stone edifice at Crescent and Temple Streets. It sounds like for a little bit there was talk of reuniting the churches, especially after St. George's burned down, but that never happened. I haven't been able to figure out what the argument was, though, you know, people are petty. It was probably just squabbling between old families, right? But I found a really nice description of the church in a July 25th, 1887 Brooklyn Daily Times article all about the different churches in the area, so I wanted to read from that. Its architecture is early Gothic, and with its solid walls clad in ivy, the elegant pile reminds one of what he has seen in old European towns. A young church, it already takes on an old appearance. Here many of the old Astoria families of the Episcopal Church worship, but not the oldest who are to be found at St. George's Episcopal Church. So I was walking around the area, as I tend to do, last month, 
And I stumbled across this church. I had actually never heard of the Church of the Redeemer. I just happened to walk by. I was like, wow, what's this? And I was poking around the churchyard because whenever I see a church, I try to see if there's a churchyard that maybe has tombstones or anything. And there's a really beautiful garden outside the church that's just, you know, open to everyone. And I noticed that while there didn't seem to be a cemetery next to the church, there was a grave marker in the churchyard garden. And it didn't look like just any old monument, like a statue or something or a plaque. No, it was a grave marker. And it even had one of the little footstones, you know, with initials next to it. But I didn't see any other grave markers, and I was puzzled about what was up with that. So I did some research, like I always do, and I found out that a retired merchant named Cornelius Rappel, Rappelia, spelled R-A-P-E-L-Y-E, I'll say Rappelia, I guess, Trafford donated some money to the parish, and that was a much appreciated bequest since the church had money problems. So according to a February 19th, 1899 article in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, quote, through the death of Cornelius Rappel Trafford, a wealthy historian, the church was left $10,000 for a set of chimes. The bells were purchased and placed in the church tower built for that purpose. I found a little bit of info about Trafford in the book History of Long Island City by J.S. Kelsey, which was written in 1896. So Trafford was born in 1809. He died in 1872. His father was one of the earliest colonizers to live at Hallett's Cove, which is right on the waterfront of Astoria. It's right by Socrates Sculpture Park and Costco nowadays. And the family lived at a beautiful mansion that even back then was already 100 years old. Here's a bit more of of what the book had to say about him. Mr. Trafford was a man of large means, which he expended liberally in the building of very many of the most attractive dwellings in different parts of Astoria, and particularly on the hill, always the aristocratic section. He was largely interested in the Astoria Ferry, and aided materially in the first introduction of streetcars, in fact, which was, to the time of his decease, one of the most important factors in the community. He was noted for his geniality, and many remember with pleasure and gratitude his acts of unostentatious charity. Mr. Trafford was never married, and therefore leaves no direct descendants to perpetuate the name. The beautiful chimes in the tower of the Episcopal Church of the Redeemer on the Crescent were given in his will by Mr. Trafford, and annually, on the recurrence of his birthday, ring out sweet melodies. A massive granite cross is a striking feature on the beautiful lawn in front of the church, and marks the last resting place of Mr. Trafford. So that last bit is the most interesting part to me. I had to do hours of research in order to find anything that confirmed what that marker was and whether he was actually buried there. So this book seems to claim that he was buried there, which is a little weird since no one else is buried there, but I guess it's not unheard of. After all, if you think about places like Asheville on the top of Mount Mitchell, there was a geologist or something, some sort of scientist who died on the mountain and was buried up there. But my guess with the Trafford Monument had been that it was put up as a sign of appreciation to honor the gift that Trafford made to the church. And I don't totally know why that would be in the form of a grave marker, but I was thinking, you know, as the 19th century, grave markers are expensive, but probably not as expensive as like a sculpture or a statue or something. So maybe that was the best option they had to honor him. However, I don't actually know that Trafford is actually buried next to the church. Because according to findagrave.com, Trafford seems to be buried in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, which was the big popular burial place for the wealthiest 19th century New Yorkers, and who is buried alongside George R. Rappelier. Man, I can't say that. I know I've, I've pronounced that name differently every time I've said it. I have no idea how you pronounce that. And his wife, Jane Maria Soydam, S-U-Y-D-A-M, another difficult to pronounce name. So it makes sense to me that he would be buried at Greenwood Cemetery. But I wonder if he maybe was initially buried outside the Church of the Redeemer and then moved to Greenwood or 
if maybe he is still buried in the church, but they built a monument to him in Greenwood anyway, because of the prestige? Like, I don't know. But he can't be both places at once. One of them is a burial monument, you know, tombstone with no one buried there. So it's a mystery that I haven't been able to crack. I keep finding out information about it. And, you know, I was like, okay, he's buried at Greenwood. And I was like, okay, maybe not. (laughs) Who knows? But if anybody knows, please tell me. Because I have now spent many hours puzzling over this. Because I am great at finding productive uses for my time. So before we leave this potentially false burial spot, there's an amazing part of the church's history that is so weird and exciting and feels like it should be a movie. So I just want to read from an article that I found in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. This is from that February 19th, 1899 one that I was reading from earlier. So to read from the article. Some years after the robbery of the Northampton Bank in Northampton, Massachusetts, one of the alleged burglars made a confession in prison. He said that several million dollars worth of bonds taken from the bank were hidden under the floor in the belfry, and they remained there for several years until one of the gang could get them again. The records of the police department of Long Island City showed that the entrance to the church had been forced on the date that the confession said the bonds were placed in the belfry, and also on the date of their alleged removal. How amazing is that? Some bank robbers hid millions of dollars worth of loot in the tower of the church? And I've looked for more information about this and probably will keep looking for more information. I feel like there should be a movie about this. This is so interesting and fun. And it, the article is so funny because it kind of just throws this in as sort of an aside. And I'm like, man, this should be the whole article. I mean, millions of dollars in the late 19th century? That's a lot of money. And I hope the robbers had a great time. And maybe the guy who ended up in prison got to leave prison and have a nice time too. That's just amazing. I just love that story. So the last cemetery I want to talk about today is in that same part of Astoria, you know, Astoria Village, old Astoria. And this cemetery is Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Roman Catholic Cemetery, also known as the Irish Famine Cemetery. So I first visited this cemetery on a run on a rainy Friday night last April. It's very close to Astoria Park, so I was running up to Astoria Park and dropped by the cemetery. And this cemetery holds the remains of Irish immigrants who moved to Astoria in the 19th century to escape the Great Famine in Ireland. So between 1840 and 1890, about 150 people were buried in this cemetery. The last burial was in 1926, and all but one of the people buried there were Irish. The one non-Irish person buried there was the church's gardener, who was Italian. It was actually really surprising to me that there was a Catholic cemetery in Astoria, because once Calvary Cemetery opened, not so far from there, in... 1848, most Catholics in Astoria, and I think in the city in general, were buried in Calvary, which is why just a handful of people were interred in this little cemetery. So the site was once the churchyard of Our Lady of Mount Carmel Roman Catholic Church, back when it was called St. John's Church. And the church was founded in 1841. Incidentally, the same year that Fordham University was founded in the Bronx. Seems like The 1840s were a really big time period, bustling time period for the Catholic Church in New York, which I talk about a lot more actually in my episode about Dagger John, one of the Calvary Cemetery episodes. He was a very vicious and influential Catholic archbishop who was in power around this time. So the original church building was a wooden frame building that sat next to the cemetery. And initially there weren't that many Catholics in the area, but as the Catholic community grew, the church was expanded and eventually they needed to build a larger building, which they constructed on Newtown Avenue, a few blocks away from the cemetery. And that left this little cemetery alone on an ordinary corner of a busy street. And the current church building is really beautiful. It has some nice Gothic influences. It was finished in 1873. 
It's a very cool looking church. But the Irish Famine Cemetery is so strange to me. It just feels so out of place. So today the cemetery sits behind a chain link fence and it's across a little side street from a flat tire repair shop, like a car repair shop, which there are plenty of in the area. But there's just something so funny about like walking by a pile of tires and then suddenly being at a decrepit little cemetery. And this is right in the area of a story that I've talked about before. So it's right by the Triborough and Hellgate Bridges. And the cemetery is pretty much, as far as I'm aware, never open to the public. But you can go up to it. You can look through the chain link fence. I always have a really nice time checking it out. And, you know, like I mentioned, it is decrepit. There are tombstones that have been knocked over. There are tombstones that are literally sinking into the ground. It's very creepy. It's very cool. I do wish it was better maintained. I believe it's maintained by the Archdiocese of Brooklyn, which I think Queens kind of falls into. And the cemetery feels just kind of forgotten. It's like it was left on this corner of the street and just nobody thought about it again. I think I read somewhere that the church occasionally does services in that cemetery, which I think is great. And, you know, I'm really glad it's still there. I'm glad it's not like so many other small cemeteries in the area, which have just been built over by factories or fancy apartment buildings or whatever, you know, it would have been easy to sell the land and then move the bodies elsewhere at some point in history. And I think it's really cool that that didn't happen and that we have this piece of history you know, I've probably talked about this before, but I really love cemeteries because they're like little portals into our history and all of them come with their own stories and their own characters. And so much of history to me feels anonymous. The stories we know are usually focused on the rich and famous and often evil people who made a name for themselves. And we forget all about the ordinary people who came before us. And that's the thing I really love about cemeteries in general. It sort of adds the names of ordinary people back into our history and our unconscious, even if their stories are lost. Like, I might not know the names or stories of everyone buried in the Irish Famine Cemetery, but you can visit it and read the people's names and think about what their lives might have been like. And I think that's really nice. And I'm really glad that this cemetery still exists. I'm really glad that St. George's Cemetery still exists. And it's been a lot of fun over the last year or so checking out all these hidden little cemeteries around the area. So that'll do it for this week. I have more hidden cemeteries to talk about next week. So stay tuned for that. And in the meantime, you can follow the show on Instagram at Buried Secrets Podcast. I'll try and post some pictures of these cemeteries over the next week or so. You can check out the show notes with all of the sources I used for this episode at buriedsecretspodcast.com. You can write to me at buriedsecretspodcast at gmail.com. If you liked this episode, please tell your friends about it. Please rate and review the podcast on your podcatcher of choice, whether it's iTunes or something else. And thanks so much for listening.